I may now turn to my special guest, David Strong, the editor of The Last Oil Shock, a survival guide to the imminent extinction of Petroleum Man, an absolutely <laughs> outstanding title, beautiful designed cover, and produced by a very uh, prestigious publishing house, uh, Murray, which is uh, a subsidiary of one of the top publishers in the uh, country. John Murray, The Last Oil Shock Publishing, David Strawn, the author. Now, David, you had a piece in The Guardian this morning, which many viewers will already have seen, so they'll have a taste of the thesis of this book, which I would summarize as being that the oil will reach its peak in the next decade, and that the Iraq war, therefore, was very definitively about securing a hold on the last big oil fields, which are perhaps not as big as you implied today, uh, as uh, some of the holders of them were claiming that they were. In other words, time's running out for petroleum man and for the oil economy. Is that a fair summary? I think so, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have put it better, better myself. Um, it's, you uh, can hire me. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just cheap, I'm free. <laughs> no, it's very good. I mean, I, I think that the, the uh, you know, the, the Iraq war was not just all about oil. I think a lot of people think that, but I think when they say all about oil, they, I think they tend to think about oil companies and profits. And I don't think it was, I think it was about something much more important than profit, and it's a physical shortage of oil. And I think that the, the neocons and, uh, and Bush and Cheney particularly, and I think Tony Blair were all aware of this and these developments that were coming up very shortly. And that was a, a, a really significant factor in the, in the decision to go to war. And that, that is basically the thesis. Oil. Israel and the demonstration of overwhelming American power in the Middle East for the discouragement of Les Autres. That's uh, my thesis. I've never said it was oil alone. But your book and your article today seem to imply that uh, you can no longer wriggle out of the idea that oil played a part in it. Iraq, perhaps the biggest oil field in the world, certainly the biggest Middle Eastern supplier uh, with significant fields as yet untapped. That's, a, that's absolutely right. I mean, that was well known before, before the invasion, of course. Iraq was in a peculiar position. It, you know, it's got the third largest oil reserves in the world, according to the official figures, and you're right to, to call those into doubt. But, so it's got the, anyway, officially the third largest reserves, yet before the war, of course, it was, uh, it was under sanctions, and that meant that the, the oil industry could only produce something less than two million barrels a day, or that's what it was producing. Uh, had there been no sanctions um, and were there peace, uh, you could imagine that those sorts of reserves will produce perhaps three times that much, much on a daily basis, so perhaps six million barrels a day. Um, now, uh, of course, you can't do that with the sanctions there, and if, uh, as far as uh, Tony Blair and George Bush are concerned, you can't lift the sanctions with Saddam there, so therefore Saddam had to go. I mean, that's, that's the logic as I see it. Mm. The, uh, uh, it's maybe beyond the purview of the book, but one of my takes on the Sudan situation is that much of the Western hostility towards the government in Khartoum is underlain by the fact that Sudan has an ocean of oil underneath its soil, and even worse, it's contracted it to China already. Well, I think that's that's that's. I think that the last part is 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 where I'd agree with you. I mean, I think this 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 there's a growing hostility between particularly America and China uh, about who gets the remains of the of the oil. Um, you know, China is going around the world um, doing what the, the the Americans object to, which is is locking up entire fields and entire countries with deals, mm. which they object to very strongly. Um, and, and, and I'd point to Iran in that in that connection as well. I mean, the the, the Chinese and the Iranians did a, a massive deal not so long ago about $70 billion deal for LNG and, and, and oil supplies covering about the next 25 years. And, um, you know, as, as somebody who testified to an American, uh, American committee, in fact, uh, no, I'm, I don't mean you, I mean somebody else did, and uh, um, uh, not quite such a testy uh, uh, um, uh, confrontation, uh, an American oil expert said, you know, every, every uh, barrel of oil that goes to China is one less for America. And mm. I think they are now behaving as if really this is a zero-sum game, and that's, that's, that's where we're headed. Well, uh, Donald Rumsfeld did say in terms, not exactly, but it's not a distorted uh, inference, he did say it's not America's fault that God put America's oil under other people's countries. Well, yes, uh, no, I mean, that does, does appear to be the attitude. I mean, you know, how did our oil get there? Yes, <laughs> and of course, uh, I was going to ask you that, but you've touched on it already. The same logic that underpinned the need to be in control of Iraq if uh, oil at the right price and at the right flow was going to be maintained 
and priced in dollars rather than in euros uh, must underpin the part, uh, partly underpin the confrontation with Iran. Uh, absolutely, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, I'm not sure that it's in, entirely the, the entire story, no, no, but, but, no. But, but indeed, I mean, it's, Iran has the second largest uh, reserves in the mm -hmm. world, and, and you know, uh, if, if, the, if the nuclear conflict goes wrong, or if the uh, US-Iran uh, conflict goes wrong, you know, that's a lot of oil, not simply in the long term, but in the short term. I mean, the, it's, I think it's a, it's a mistake to see Iran as powerless in this conflict, mm -hmm. anything but. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's um, I mean, the oil supply situation is so tight now that the two and a half million barrels a day that Iran supplies to the world are absolutely, absolutely critical. So if it is attacked, I think the first thing that Iran will do is, is to is cut to turn it off. Yes, exactly, yes. indeed. So that's Although presumably Cheney was uh, touring the Gulf to try and ensure that in the short term at least, Gulf production and Saudi production would, uh, would dramatically rise to make up for that eventuality. Well, that, it would be a forlorn hope because the, the spare capacity that Saudi has, I mean, the, there are varying, there are varying different estimates of, of how much spare capacity there is in the, in the total global oil system, and most of it's in Saudi Arabia, and most of it's very heavy and sour oil. Uh, and the problem with that is that we don't have the refineries, the upgrading capacity to deal with that. So it's it's the wrong kind of oil. Mm. And uh, so uh, we may find actually what well, if that were to happen, if I Iran were to cut off its supplies, then we would find I think pretty quickly. Um, exactly how relevant that alleged spare capacity is and it might be that it's very much smaller than the three three million well, barrels a day that's supposed. I'll give you the benefit of personal conversations I've had with uh, with both Iranian uh, and Venezuelan sources who know what they're talking about uh, and the first is that if Iran is attacked it will not just turn off its own oil it will try to make sure that its neighbors aren't producing either in other words they will follow a scorched earth policy in the Arabian Gulf from which the attack on Iran undoubtedly either by land, sea or air uh, will have been launched and places like Qatar for example, uh, Bahrain, the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia, uh, all well within range of Iranian striking power would be struck and therefore the capacity to up their production would be severely limited militarily but also when I was in Venezuela recently I can tell you that the Venezuelans uh, agreed with Ahmadinejad when he was there that if Iran was attacked, Venezuela would switch off its oil production too. Yes. Certainly its supplies to the United States. And so we could, in the and by the way, just to alarm the viewers still more, the Sunday papers in Tel Aviv were full of feverish speculation that a war is imminent. Uh, the chief of the defense staff uh, named five adversaries, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, uh, Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah, uh, which are coming into a critical mass, they say, of confrontation with Israel. And perhaps in July, in other words, in a couple of weeks, uh, this will erupt in fighting on one, two, three, four, or all five fronts. So the idea that Iran is to be attacked, at one time fanciful and thought to be bluff, at least so far as the Israeli media is concerned, is now a real prospect. Uh, well, I, I think the, the it, it's, it's hard to imagine, although perhaps with recent history, pr perhaps, perhaps not so hard, but you know, it's hard to imagine an American administration being quite so stupid as to do it now, particularly given where we are in Iraq. But, but I've always thought that, that uh, the amount of control that uh, America has over, over uh, Israel is questionable, and actually that that's where the, that that's where the, 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 the trouble might start. Mm. And if anything, if that scenario that you're, you're painting were to, to come about, well, or even if it were to look as if it were imminent, um, I don't think there's really any, any particular ceiling on the oil price. Uh, you know, the, 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 the oil market is a terribly volatile thing in any event, and a small shortage leads to a very, you know, a disproportionate rise in the price, and the, the, the reverse is also true, but, but that's what you'd be worrying about. And, uh, you know, even two million bar barrels a day taken off the market um, in, in a very tight market is, is, is pretty catastrophic. If it were a, a, a wider confl conflagration like the one you talk about, then you know all bets are off. I think you know we could be talking several hundred dollars a barrel, and of course the economic impacts of that would be would be catastrophic. We'd be in well, a very we'll deep recession. Come on to that in recession. a second, but I, I, I merely opine something stupid. George W. Bush mm, computes to me. Uh, just I know you said you can't put a cap on it, and of course. Uh, n not only can you not put a cap on it, it's, it's maybe unfair to ask you to predict, but 
I mean, it isn't impossible that you won't be able to get oil for, for love nor money at any price, really. Well, I when you talk three, four, five hundred dollars a barrel, you're more or less saying that whole industries will close down, that whole communities will not be able to drive, that, uh, that uh, oil will simply run out. Well, all those, thing, all those things are possible, and I think that in, uh, when you get um, those kinds of price responses, uh, uh, as we saw with the petrol protests, which were, a very, which were I think, uh, you know, a, a very minor uh, premonition of what, 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 what might come along, um, you get hoarding. You know, the, the, you know the, the system breaks down when people, because it's a, it's a just-in-time system, people expect you know, to be able to turn up at a petrol station and for their cars to be filled up, and, and the entire system works on that basis. When that trust breaks down, mm. everybody everybody clearly hangs on to what they've got and and that's not just individuals that's countries that's traders that's oil companies and so forth so i think you know it's it, it becomes very it's very difficult to predict exactly what would happen in those circumstances but it is well, a kind so of run on the bank yeah, wouldn't yeah. you they run, run on oil indeed yes, yes. And, and yeah but i do think actually there's 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 one other way you could look at this which is that you know the people i think also tend to think that, that the optimists in this debate will say that you know if the price of oil goes up that helps actually because you know if it goes up and stays up it sends all the right signals you know we start saving oil and that sort of thing but when it's when it's this when it's this sudden and this this much of a spike and this huge, and this huge it's it's, it's uh, i think a very a very different matter um what might happen though that if if it, if it puts us into a very deep recession demand for oil will come down again as demand will ev for everything obviously will come down um and as a result you could find that you have a glut again oddly enough because if demand comes down so much below the productive capacity that's already there, mm. all of a sudden you haven't got a, a shortage, you've got perhaps several million barrels a day too much. Mm. So I think we could have a really, really confused and volatile. volatile situation. Yeah. Here's James texting, do you think George Bush will invade Venezuela next in his hunt for, hunt for oil? I see that uh, Chavez warned uh, today, in today's papers anyway, he must have said it yesterday, that uh, the Venezuelans must be prepared for guerrilla war against the United States. An invasion, though, unlikely. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's likely. I mean, they, they tried it. They tried a coup, didn't they, not so long ago? Uh, uh, um, and 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 it, and it didn't work out too well. I mean, I think I I, I must. I just I don't know. You may think I'm naive, but I have to believe that uh, given the given the experience that we've that we've you know of Iraq in the last few years, that uh, that even the um, the 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 Bush. Uh, Administration is chastened to, uh, and and that its ability to do this to do this stuff is 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 reduced. I have to believe that. But well, I, I'm with you on that. But uh, you know, a wounded animal uh, in its death throes yep. uh, is capable of uh, that's, 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 uniquely that's dangerous. Now here's Naz in Halifax asking the sixty-four thousand dollar question that I was going to turn to next. Can the world do without oil? Well, I mean, clearly in the short term, not. I don't know if in the book you deal with this. In your article today, given the shortage of space that you had, you weren't really able to turn to the, if you like, the bigger question of now that even leaving aside wars, mad presidents, uh, invasions and so on, leaving all that aside, if oil will peak in the next decade, by definition that means that oil will be a declining uh, product thereafter with the human race having thousands of years, we hope, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, to last ultimately without it. What can we do about that? Well, uh, we could start thinking about it seriously now. Um, there's, a, there's a report out which you may, you may have heard of, the Hirsch Report. Um, yes. It's actually commissioned by the, oddly enough, commissioned by the US Department of Energy. Um, although once they received it, they put it in the drawer for about six months because they were a bit alarmed by the, by the conclusions that it, it had come to. Um, but the, the long and the short of it is that uh, if we don't start doing something about this at least a decade, and preferably 20 years before the event, then we have really no uh, no possibility of avoiding a some kind of a paralyzing shortage. Um, so the sooner we get on with it, the better. And the other big thing to hang on to is there's actually no shortage of energy. I mean, you know, the the, the amount of sunshine and wind that uh, you know that hit, hits the earth um, every day could supply all of our energy needs uh, at present, many times over. It's simply a question of how we get from here to there. And that's not that's that's not a small thing. Um, the, the the problem is again the, the the time frame that's being imposed upon us. You know, if this peak happens at any stage within the in the next decade, that's a real that's a real stretch. Um, so, I think in the short term, what it's going to mean is not only that we that, that we are that we are unlikely to to change our, our our fuel supply system quickly enough to do this seamlessly. That's I think certainly true. We're going to we're going to simply have to live with uh, with shortage. Uh, I think we're going to we're going to have to introduce policies which, in, in fact, 
um, suppress demand. We've never done that before. You know, I mean, look, look what's happened to tax, tax policy in Britain over the years. It's been knocked about by, by protests and so forth. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to find ways of constraining consumption um, because, really, well, really, the, that's the only way to do it, really, either on a sort of uh, a societal level or an international level. We're going to have to constrain our consumption. Otherwise, we're going to be fighting for what's left. You know, that's, those, those are the kind of choices, really. Now, here's uh, on the subject of fighting. Chris in Maypole, I don't know if that's Maypole or Mabel. Uh, if Iran is attacked, welcome to World War III. Well, we've, we've touched on that, Chris, and uh, it certainly begins to feel a bit like uh, uh, World War III. Where does nuclear fit in in this well, mix, it's, David? Well, it's a hot potato. Um, uh, I'm uh, in a... And I'm in a bit of a minority amongst people who write about peak oil. Many peak oil uh, commentators are extremely anti-nuclear, and I can see their arguments. But I am a, um, I've changed my view, in fact, uh, uh, having researched this for a, in the last couple of years. I, like the government, can't see how the sums, I mean, the sums don't stack up anyway, but it seems to be willful to, to rule out nuclear power um, because that makes the deficit even larger than it would otherwise be. And uh, that's, uh, I think, a fairly commonsensical point of view. Um, but yeah, that's that, that's where I stand. Having said that, uh, it's quite you know it's quite clear that things are, uh, are not going to be easy in terms of nuclear because we're seeing already that there's uh, emerging shortage in the uranium market and the uranium price is going going through the roof. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, now that may be we don't yet know whether that's actually to do with fundamental shortage or the fact that a number of mines around the world have been uh, have been closed due to flooding and that sort of thing. Um, Time will tell, um, and of course, you know there are enormous downsides to nuclear power. Um, uh, but as I say, uh, I think my, my own view is that given that we have to deal with climate change as well as peak oil, we're going to need every last scrap of low CO2 emitting well, energy. I, I suspect that you're right there. Here's a text: Neither Britain nor America will attack Iran. There's no appetite for another war in Washington, and therefore London will. I'm not sure where the texter gets the uh, conclusion that there's no appetite for another war in Washington. I certainly think there can. It's, it seems inconceivable that there could be appetite for another war in London. I can't imagine that Gordon Brown wants to start his premiership uh, dealing with yet another uh, war in the Middle East. No, indeed. Although maybe that's why he sent Tony Blair out there. Uh, who knows? Here's one from uh, Madge in Brighton who says, what oil crisis? I'm not sure what Madge means by that. But, I mean, you're fairly clear. I mean, I, I was struck by what you said in The Guardian this morning that Britain passed its peak as long ago as 1999. Yeah. How fast are we declining? I mean, are we running fast. out fast? Yeah, absolutely. When will we be dry? Well, um, I mean, that is always the wrong way to look at it, um, but it's the rate of change that's the really important thing. Um, and we're, we're falling at about 10% a year. I mean, and I do think that that's, you know, the, the speed with which North Sea oil has been, has been falling, our, our output has been falling, has been a sig so far unremarked, but significant, in, you know, it's had a significant impact on our foreign policy. I think, you know, those things, those things, those things certainly do stack and up. where are we buying the shortfall? Well, um, uh, I actually don't know where, where you know, it's, it's, it's a fungible market. It's, it's on the international market. Um, uh, it's, it's but we're not particularly dependent on any one country. No, I, th I mean, the in thing the way is... That the U.S., for example, seems particularly dependent on Venezuelan uh, oil. Yes, Venezuela and Canada for the U.S., mm -hmm. um, simply because they are large producers right there. Um, you know, we'll be getting... Um, I, I guess from uh, from Norway, but also from the Middle East. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the is main is Norway is Norway past its peak? Yes, just past its peak. Um, mm. and rather better managed, I think, in a sense. Um, but the, yes, they 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 peaked, I think, in two thousand and one, and are falling fairly 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 mm. Mm. stiffly as well. When did the book come out, David? Uh, two months ago, it's, and uh, it's on its uh, third print run. Third print run already. Well, it's an outstanding product by John Murray, publishers. Written by David Strawn. Now you spell that S T R A H A N if you're looking for it on the internet. S T R A H A N. David Strawn, The Last Oil Shock, a survival guide to the imminent extinction of petroleum man. An outstanding author, an outstanding book, an outstanding article in today's Guardian. You can go to the Guardian online and read it today and get a taste of what this uh, expert is saying about the role that oil is playing in current international crises and the role that the lack of oil is going to play in the future of humankind itself. Big subjects, but he's a big enough man for it. David, thank you very thank much you for George. joining us on The Real Deal. It's been first class.